Well, they're basically sort of three legs of the stool of campaign spending. Um, one are uh, the kinds of contributions that are given directly to candidates. The second are contributions that are given to um, super PACs, um, that is political action committees. And then you also have this third type, which is the type that I've been interested in, which we call dark money. Um, and this is money that is going through groups that claim they're not really political. They're supposed to be social welfare groups. They're kind of quasi charities. But in fact, um, they've gotten more and more involved in American politics in sort of spending, putting up ads, pushing agendas. And um, they're very unpoliced, and you don't know where the money's coming from. So in the current campaign year, of the money that's being spent, um, one third is sort of traditional campaign contributions. Two thirds now is dark money. And when you say in the two thirds is dark money, you mean not only the presidential elections, but also elections for? Right. I'm all kinds of elections going up and down the ballot on the U.S. elections right now. So, so there's this kind of explosion of dark money. It, it followed the Supreme Court's decision in 2010 in the Citizens United case, um, which allowed individuals and corporations and unions to spend unlimited amounts on, on politics. Um, and a lot, it, people don't really, didn't really realize it, but among the, when they lifted the lid on corporate spending, these groups are called uh, nonprofit corporations, and those groups had their lid lifted too. So suddenly there's all this, this corporate spending by nonprofit groups, and that's what dark money is. What happened was the Supreme Court said it would be corrupt if rich people and businesses gave money directly to the politicians. Everybody knows that it's really a bribe, probably, when you're giving a huge amount of money just to a politician. You probably want something back. But the Supreme Court said, if those same people, the rich individuals and businesses, give money to an outside group that's not the candidate, but it's just supporting the candidate, then it won't be corrupt because it's not a direct gift to the candidate. So all of these groups, they're called independent groups, meaning they're independent of the candidate's campaign. Independent groups have exploded. And that's what we're seeing in American politics is just this explosion of money to these groups. And it's really just a, a, a thin veneer to say that, they're, that they are any less corrupt from my standpoint because these groups now, they're literally groups that are a political action committee for a particular candidate. And there's almost no difference whether you're giving to the outside group or giving to the campaign. The candidates know who you are if you're giving a million dollars, whether it's to them directly or to the group that's supporting them. And so it's, it's, it's breaking down this whole idea that it's not corrupt. What I've heard in, in terms of rebuttal from more right-wing people in the media is that, well, the politicians, of course, are not coordinating with the super PACs or with the donors, right? There's no, uh, they have to officially not coordinate. Right. Um, but you're saying that's, that's essentially a sham, or it's just a, it's window dressing on, and then they know exactly who's giving them money for what. It sort of, it, it almost doesn't matter, but they, they I mean, the, the super PACs are often run by the politicians' closest aides, who then sort of take a vow of silence and stop speaking to the candidate and run this organization for them. It, I mean, it, it's just, uh, it's become kind of made a mockery of the whole system, really. I mean, everybody can see it's kind of a joke, really, at this point. So how, how fair is it, in your estimation, having done all the research for this really remarkable book, um, to say that the United States is essentially a plutocracy, not a democracy? Well, it's, it's democratic in the sense that you still have one man, one vote. But what's happening is it's a little more complicated. What's happening is this money's influencing not just who gets elected, but also what kinds of issues are talked about. It's, it has a huge influence on the government itself. What gets done in Congress is influenced by it. So it's, it's sort of suffusing through the pores. I don't know if I would say it's a plutocracy yet, but I think that's the concern that it might become one. Part of your argument, if I understand it correctly, is that it's not merely money going to individual candidates, but there's actually a almost machine-like approach from certain elements in the far right in the United States to change the nature of the debate, change the nature of, of the public sphere in terms of the ideas that are dominant and circulate. In, in your opinion, is that, is that just as or more or less important than the actual campaign contributions themselves? 
Well, the campaign contributions are just one, one piece of that. Um, and in the case of the Koch brothers, who I write about, they're, they're, there's corporate lobbying. Um, they have a huge corporation which spends money. There are the campaign contributions that they hold out for politicians who will push the ideas that they've got. And then there's a tremendous amount of spending on culture, on academia, on think tanks, on advocacy groups. There's this whole other sort of, there, there are all these different arenas where money has an I impact now in American society. Yeah, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. As a, an institute here on campus at, uh, at the University of British Columbia, w I don't think we necessarily have a sense of exactly what it's like in terms of the climate of the politicization of campus dialogue in some, uh, in some dimensions of, of the United States uh, educational system. So I know you've talked about this or written about this previously. Maybe you can tell us what that's like in terms of the setting up of these institutes or finding individual professors who are um, amenable to certain right-wing or libertarian ideologies and how that system has been propagated. Well, it, so you kind of, the, a lot of what I've got in this book is history. I became very interested in how this happened. And so you kind of have to start at the beginning. But there were a number of very wealthy, conservative, mostly corporate people who felt that in the 1970s um, that the, the academia had become way too liberal. And they wanted to try to push back at that. Uh, they felt that you know university campuses were filled with liberalism and that people, kids weren't being exposed to free market ideas. And it was very hard for them to infiltrate these campuses because the, the, the professors were resistant to the kinds of ideas they were pushing. So they came across the idea of setting up institutes within the campuses that would be devoted to their ideology, funding them very specifically with sort of strings attached that they had to teach certain things. And usually the easiest way they found to bring these, to get these, these um, centers set up was to work with a conservative professor or two, if there was one on campus, who would kind of sh shepherd the program in. So that's what they've been doing. And at this point, the Cokes in particular are funding uh, conservative programs in over 300 universities and, the, and colleges. I mean, and the reason it's important really is, I mean, it's, it's not just that they're so interested in, in balancing out, um, you know, having equal time for their ideas on campuses. They're aiming to kind of indoctrinate the next generation so that kids think like they think. Having investigated this, is it your understanding that this is actually working? Um, or Because uh, kids these days are fairly savvy. You know, the millennials are very plugged into you know, a wide range of media that simply didn't exist before. So, mm -hmm. but is, is there a substrate there, the, a fertile sort of um, ground? I think, I think they're, they're making quite a few inroads, actually, I have to say. I so mean, it's a, it's students may not realize this and or they actually are, they become sympathetic to these ideas. I mean, is there is Sure, there, is there I mean, and there's an ideology that is attractive to many people, including the Cokes. I mean, I think the candidates find the super PACs kind of uncontrollable since there's supposed to be this independence um, that suddenly these ads will go on the air that may not be exactly what the candidate had in mind. Um, but, but, and there certainly is, I mean, I think some of the donors, the rich donors, feel they're being ripped off also. They, uh, it's, it's costly and they don't know if they're getting their money's worth by paying for these TV ads. So there's, there's a lot of grumbling all the way around. But I, you know, it's sort of the only thing they've got right now. So I haven't seen a movement to abolish them because no, it's an arms race. Nobody's going to give up on them first. Right. So in terms of the, the recent campaign, both the, the Democratic primaries and now the upcoming battle between the Republican and Democrat nominees, th there's been quite a bit of discussion, at least in the, in the in popular debate, about the role of money in politics and getting money out of politics. Now that it's clearly Hillary Clinton who's the nominee, do you think that there's any prospect or any interest in the Democratic Party in changing the, the nature of the game insofar as that it was actually designed, the current situation was designed by the far right? Or are people just going to continue playing the game because that's the way that the game has to be played? No, to... I mean, H Hillary Clinton has campaigned explicitly on overturning Citizens United and said that any 
you know, we're, we're, we're missing one Supreme Court justice right now. There's supposed to be nine and there are only eight. And she said anybody, if she was elected, who she'd put on the Supreme Court would agree to overturn Citizens United and try to re redo the money system in politics. So she's been quite committed to that. That said, when her husband was president, it was, it was an era of big money, and he was infamous for, you know, giving special uh, favors to the big donors and practically renting out the Lincoln bedroom in the White House to them. So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of virtuous talk in politics, but when people get come to power, they do through the current system, and they don't always want to upset the apple cart once they're in. Right, and if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, Hillary Clinton has said that her husband would be her main economic advisor. So. She sort of took that back after saying it once, yeah. Oh, interesting, so, uh, oh. Yeah, because she got a lot of flack for, for saying that. It's a pretty big role to outsource to anyone. Right, so uh, I think the sense that a lot of young people, I would imagine in the States and certainly outside of the States as, as observers have, is that really both parties have become so deeply ingrained in the system of um, essentially legalized bribery that th that there's really no way out. Even if even if Hillary Clinton is saying that you know once she gets her Supreme Court justice, they'll overturn Citizens United, would that solve the problem? It, is the problem deeper than that? It, um, what, what are the options for young people who are observing this besides just apathy? I mean, how how could the system change? Well, I mean, the thing is, I think what people forget is we've changed it, fixed it before. Um, it wasn't very long ago that we had a huge campaign finance scandal in the Watergate scandal, and the result afterwards was a clampdown on political spending. And in the next election after that, the 1980 election, uh, neither Jimmy Carter nor Ronald Reagan spent any private money. I mean, they used the, the public funds that were available to them. And so it's, it's, it's been done. It could be done again. It, what happens with money is rules are devised to try to stop it. It's like money is like water. It, it, find its, it finds its way around, and then you have to stop it up again. And it's just been like that since 1900. And we're at another one of those tipping points. I, I do think it could be done. I mean, part of the reason is the American public in huge numbers thinks there's too much money in politics. It's, there's a bi there aren't that many things that Republicans and Democrats agree on these days. This is one of them. Like 90% of the American public wants to see Citizens United overturned. Yeah, and my, my understanding, at least as a Canadian observer again, is that um, a lot of the frustration people have is, is knowing that that's how they that's what their political opinion is, but not seeing any channel through which this could actually materialize. So are there any specific, I know this is not actually, exactly. Actually, I don't think that's, I mean, I think that that's um, being too pessimistic. Uh, I mean, I, it is a heavy lift. I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not Pollyannish about this, but, but again, there's, we're, there's a missing Supreme Court justice. It's, we're down to eight, and there needs to be nine. The only reason Citizens United was decided the way it was was that Sandra Day O'Connor was replaced by John Roberts. And it's one difference in a Supreme Court justice is what brought the Citizens United decision in the first place. And one justice being different could probably change it. And um, you know, I think that's the question is whether that's going to happen. You know, if Hillary Clinton's elected, she has committed to doing that. Um, we'll see if people hold her feet to the fire. Is she, is she actually on the record as saying Oh, that? yeah. She's very much on the record saying it, that she's going to overturn Citizens You know, she would appoint a Supreme Court justice who would overturn Citizens United. I mean, what happens then is hard to say. But, um, but you know, it depends how they overturn it and what they put in its place. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the justice that Barack Obama sort of nodded to to replace the late uh, Scalia was not in favor of overturning it. it am I incorrect? Is, is that incorrect? You know, I'm not sure whether Merrick Garland has committed one way or the other on this. Um, I don't know. Um, so I, I, I don't think he's ever said he's against it. Um, but I don't, he's a very cautious judge, and I'm not sure he's ever taken a public position on that. It's really a policy question almost. I'm, I'm not sure that I've heard that. In terms of understanding the, the Democrats' potential motivation for overturning it and, and making more of an uh, equal playing field, some, plenty of people push back and say, especially in the, uh, in the younger cohort, push back and say, yeah, but all these, all these congressmen and women 
even on the Democrats, are so you know, knee deep or neck deep in, uh, in donations and corporate money that, that they really don't have an actual interest in doing it. The truth is, though, I mean, what people don't understand is a lot of the congressmen and senators, people who are elected, hate the money system. They spend all day long on the phone trying to raise money because they have to. But they've, that's not why they, most of them go into public life. They want to deal with you know, solving various kinds of political problems. It's, it's, it's made it a misery to be in public office. And so, I mean, I think many of them would support change if they thought that it wouldn't wreck their chances of getting reelected. Uh, yes, but that's the question, exactly, right? Right, but if you if you make some kind of reform that evens the playing field, you know, that that affects everybody equally, there's really no reason why they should be against it. So, for a younger generation that's that's listening and grappling, listening to and grappling with these issues, what are the levers of change in your? Uh, in your experience, I know that's not exactly what you focused well, on. Well, I mean, there was there. It's not what I've, I've focused on, and 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 so you know, one one of the things that I think is very important, and it has failed by one vote in Congress, is a, a something called the Disclose Act, which to begin with at least shows you where the money is. It requires disclosure of political spending in a way that we don't have now. You've got to be able to see where the money's coming from. And that's one of the things the Supreme Court really said would be true, that we would have transparency. And we don't, because so much money's going to these dark money groups. So they need to disclose what they're spending. Corporations, there's another reform that would be great. Corporations um, have been asked to disclose what they're spending on politics and to- In terms of lobbying? Every, every year, no, spending even in electoral politics and not put, if they're putting it into these dark money groups, for instance, the Chamber of Commerce, um, you can't see which company is putting that money in under some reforms that are being talked about, the companies would have to disclose this. And you know, if you knew that, for instance, take any company, Walmart, was backing some particularly um, controversial candidate, I think that shoppers might care and react. And people need to know that. So that, that's something we're talking about in, this, in our country also. Um, transparency, making companies publicly show what they're spending on politics is an issue that came up in front of the Security and Exchange Commission and is something that the executive branch can impose. So um, many people have been pushing the White House to try to make it happen. So under a Clinton presidency? You could push for that, yeah. Or even under a God forbid. Even under a Trump, Trump presidency, you could push for that. I mean, he's claimed, Trump has claimed that he is not beholden to uh, private interests or, you know, corrupt backers. He says the system's rigged, so he hasn't explained how he's going to unrig it. On that note, actually, if we can maybe just parse out these various elements on the, on the far right, because it's become kind of confusing for people now that Trump has actually won the nomination. Um, at this, even though all this dark money has been, has been poured into other right-wing candidate, it's pretty much any right-wing candidate other than Trump, yet Trump has succeeded. Mm -hmm. So is there some sort of internal battle on the right going on here that, um, th that goes beyond what, what you've managed to uncover in the book? How, how should we, how are we as observers supposed to pull apart this? this There's mass, the, mass? a ton of dark money being spent by the same players as ever, the Kochs and, and others. It's to hold on to Congress.